to Mike Miranda, and he's going to talk about intraarticular osteotomies. Okay, so my task this morning is to talk about intraarticular malunions of the distal femur, look at indications uh, for osteotomy and techniques. So um, as is typical with the AO, we have a, a group of friends that support us and help us. And uh, so for this talk, I'd like to uh, especially recognize both Mauricio as well as Professor Joe Sasker. Joe is a, um, uh, an actually pioneer uh, uh, in this particular subject, uh, in addition to his many other subjects. So I'd like to recognize uh, all the help he's provided for uh, this particular talk. So our learning objectives this morning are to review some of the anatomy as well as approaches to the distal femur, talk about the indications for osteotomy and the scientific basis for them, as well as go through some techniques in dealing with these metaphyseal and epiphyseal fracture malunions. So we're going to start off with a case. So this is a 70-year-old woman who presents status post a complex distal femur fracture about eight months status post repair. You can see that her original fixation was a hybrid fixation. So she has non-locking screws proximally. She has locking screws distally. She had no lag fixation at the joint and a bridging construct. This went on to fail. And you can see failure of the hardware as well as a non-union at the metadiaphyseal uh, junction, as well as a malunion at the articular surface. Okay, so when we gather up and generate a problem list for this unfortunate patient, she has an epiphyseal uh, malunion with stuff off. She has metaphyseal non-union. She has osteopenia and osteoporosis that we uh, know about. She also will have defects from her previous implants. And so we have to start generating a plan for this. Her clinical exam is that of a synovitic knee. Overall, lower extrem uh, extremity is deconditioned from, uh, from non-functional use. Uh, she also has a varus alignment and she has limited range of motion from scarring as well as synovitis. And you can see that her intraop photos you can see why the knee is so painful for her. She's got this fairly extensive synovitis there. And you can see her malunion. And her clinical presentation is pretty consistent with, these, with those patients having uh, this particular malady. That is that they present with pain, stiffness, they have instability, they have some deformity. Radiographically, they have some incongruity of their joint. They have a malunion. Uh, they have some bony demineralization, and they'll have varying degrees of osteoarthritis. So how can we help these folks when they present to us? Well, in order to successfully address these cases, you have to have an awareness of the pathology and what the variation is from normal. You have to have a knowledge base, which includes information, particularly anatomy of that particular area. You have to understand the principles and management for these patients. You have to have a certain set of technical, technical skill sets, uh, and these are usually several, but you also need the resources uh, uh, in order to accomplish the task, the tools, as well as implants. All these things are necessary. And just with complex fracture surgery, I always approach it and think about it, the fact that these are really, in these cases, it's advanced application of the basic principles. So keeping yourself aware of those basic principles are key. So those fracture principles that we may employ are the restoration of the articular con congruity, restoration of normal alignment length and rotation. We wanna maintain the blood supply and create stable fixation with compression of the articular surfaces. So this is our true north. This is what help guides us as we're working through these problems. Well, in this situation of intraarticular malunions, is it the same? Well, it's a little bit different. What we want to do is we want to restore the articular congruity wherever possible. We want to restore normal alignment. We may need to unload that malunion. We need to maintain the blood supply and make sure that we get compression of articular surfaces. And there's plenty of literature uh, which extends back a, a number of years, which uh, 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 creates support uh, for this intervention and for our approach for this intervention. We know that it's a stable, an accurately reduced joint uh, will give us the optimal outcome given the situation. And there's a fair amount of data uh, recently in literature that uh, poses a potential uh, reason why these pathoanatomy or pathophysiology 
uh, uh, comes to fruition. So Furman in a uh, paper at uh, JOT 2006 proposed a mechanism where at the joint level, you know that there's incongruity and there's joint instability, there's altered joint biomechanics, creates an inflammatory response. This initiates an aberrant repair response. You get enzymatic degradation, you get matrix destruction, mechanical failure, and this leads to the clinical outcome of joint destruction, pain, and disability. So there is a scientific basis for our intervention. Well, what other knowledge do we need to know? Certainly distal femur anatomy is uh, complex and the vascular anatomy is what I wanna draw your attention to. And I specifically wanna make two points. One is that you really have to have a thorough under understanding of the different approaches for these cases. And you have to understand that the posterior medial condyle of the distal femur has a limited vascular supply and you need to be careful with that. And I'll explain why. When you look at the various approaches around the knee, these are some that you're, uh, I'm sure in this audience are, are familiar with. The established lateral approach is something that was used. It's primarily a distal femoral diaphyseal approach, which is extended to the joint. It has some advantages in that it's extensile, but it really gives you poor joint exposure. It's really a trial to try and do intraarticular work. So it may be put aside as a, as a lesser option. Midline approach is helpful because you get a parapatellar uh, either medially or laterally, you, both, you sublux the patella and you can visualize the joint nicely. One of those approaches, as described by Credic and his group, the TARPO approach as the transarticular percutaneous osteosynthesis is really a lateral retinacular approach, which uh, you can see here, helps you visualize the entirety of the joint, especially even uh, uh, medial and posterior. It's soft tissue sparing. The disadvantage is that it's not extensile on the lateral side proximally, so you may have to make secondary incisions in order to get plate fixation more along the shaft. You flex the knee and you can really get all around to the medial side. Well, what about that medial side? Is it tricky? As um, Mauricio said, um, there is a safe zone that's available, but you want to avoid dissecting posteriorly on the medial side. And we'll explain, you can see in the schematic how uh, there's a, a limited blood supply to that posterior aspect. If you were to look at a dissection that was performed, you can see that if you dissect all the way up to the high, uh, adductor hiatus, one can appreciate that the, uh, the vascularity is robust anteriorly, but there's a relative paucity posteriorly. And this is again uh, pointed out in these schematics. You can see here that on the medial side, the limited vascular supply uh, is supplied by the superior medial genicular artery, whereas laterally, you have the superior and inferior lateral genicular arteries. So you have to be just careful in your planning and execution. It's not that it's contraindicated, just care is needed. So back to the joint itself. What do we need to do uh, to correct the joint? We need to create articular congruity, stability, and recreate the alignment. How, does that, how did these manifest themselves or translate themselves into the malunions that we're concerned about? Well, you can have articular surface malunions, you can have coronal plane, plane malunions like Hoffa, or you can have rotational or condylar malunions. Let's look at the articular malreduction. So our goal would be to decrease the step off less than two millimeters. Often you see this in combination with uh, an impaction or a condylar rotation, and those need to be addressed wherever it's possible. We know that we cannot accept a step off deformity more than two times the thickness of the articular cartilage or we'll start to run into problems with uh, degradation. So this is a gentleman, 42 years old. He's status post to knee pain, uh, I'm sorry, status post to fall and he presents with a complaint of knee pain. He was initially managed non-operatively. You can see on these initial radiographs, there's some deformity of the medial condyle. You can also see that there's some uh, callus formation along the medial adductor tubercle. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this should be noted because it's very rare that you see uh, uh, callus formation with fractures or in the metaphysis. It often means that either one, they were bone grafted at some point or two, there's a, a, a non-union. Here you can see on a, a sunrise view that the uh, fracture extends across the joint and we can characterize this as a unicondylar uh, non-union, malunion, and the CT bears this out. And it's not uncommon that you see a non-union component with malunion and vice versa. 
you see spot welding, and that's a little bit of malunion with non-union work as well. So you have to be prepared for that. So in this particular situation, medial approach, you can lift up subvastus, get access to the medial condyle. You can see very, very nice uh, uh, access and then go in, fix this with compression after mobilizing that condyle and fixation. And here at 19 month follow-up, you can see that there's still a, a, a diastasis in the notch, um, excuse me. And uh, uh, that reflects the fact that with time, the uh, cartilage will die and you'll recede just like it does at the fracture ends uh, 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 for each fracture fragment. And you also wanna make sure that as you're executing your osteotomy, you avoid levering, levering on the soft metaphyseal bone. So the take-homes from that particular case are that malunions and the metaphysis are all often associated with some non-union, and you also lose, uh, often lose cartilage and bone at the osteotomy site. Compression is key. Well, what about this gentleman, a 38-year-old with a history of a fall? He was evaluated at an urgent care center and told he had a sprain. You can see some abnormalities on the lateral view there. And we know uh, after further uh, evaluation, including CT scan, that he has a Hoffa fracture. And uh, you can see here is a clinical photo showing displaced malunited piece. This is opened up, a femoral distractor allows you to unload the joint. You're able to mobilize that fragment, reduce it, fix it, try and get orthogonal fixation, which is executed here. And you can see the alignment, excuse me, um, alignment and fixation. So in these patients with an intraarticular corrective osteotomy can be performed for Hoffa malunions. It's technically challenging. You have to worry about that blood supply, but it does offer a good, con a good outcome because it recreates the stability of the joint. Absence of that stability, uh, the patient ends up with marked malalignment and increased pain. So the take homes from that case is that the medial approach is viable. You don't want it to set posteriorly and you wanna make sure that you get compression orthogonal to the fracture line. Well, let's take it up a notch. This is actually a case of Mauricio's. 34-year-old gentleman has this open grade 3A fracture, the distal femur. You can see that it's a complex fracture in the C category. And we know that the, from the papers published from the Burn Clinic, even as far back as 1992, that these particular fractures are difficult to create and make, uh, recreate and make anatomic. And so in this situation, they had the opportunity to fix it uh, and they chose to uh, try and create some compression with screws and then create nail fix, uh, place a nail and transfix the fracture. Uh, unfortunately, they violated a number of principles including creating a uh, leaving prominent hardware. There's a, a lack of compression and it's a relatively unstable construct. With instability in the construct, the patient unfortunately gets pain. So it, it limits their motion and they end up with stiffness. So at five months, he's presented to Mauricio's clinic. And we can see the radiographs here. He also has uh, essentially failure of the, uh, of the uh, construct. His clinical exam is notable for limited rotation. And so the plan was a tarpo approach, arthrolysis, removal of the hardware, intraarticular osteotomy to mobilize the condyles, condyles and uh, fix them appropriately, and use a femoral distractor to restore the patient's length and then create absolute stability and fixation with plate and screw fixation. So you can see here the clinical picture after tarpo and arthrolysis. The patient's findings uh, had severe arthrofibrosis, partially healed fracture, as well as some chondrolysis at the joint. And afterwards, we see that this is fixed with absolute stability and compression. Started on CPM right away to, to uh, create and provide nutrition for the articular cartilage. And this is the, the patient at Union. You can see the uh, functional result is outstanding. And he's very fortunate to have had uh, an excellent surgeon. So the take home from this is that a lateral approach gets you access, excellent access to the joint because if you can't see it, you can't fix it. Articular congruity and metaphyseal continuity are key. Hardware impingement around the distal femur is always a potential issue as uh, Mauricio pointed out in his talk. The impact of, uh, of cartilage loss uh, or cases of impaction um, are pretty significant and require an extra set of, uh, of skills when you uh, manage these patients. And if it's a pure depression or impaction and it's already healed, 
it's very difficult to reestablish the normal articular congru congruity. And this was recognized in the past. In younger patients, you need to think uh, about or consider oats or an allograft. And you also may need to consider an extra articular osteotomy to unload damaged areas. So you must have a number of different skill sets available. With regard to timing in this patient, you want to make sure you intervene as early as possible, and there's a number of advantages for that. We've sort of gone through some of the indications for intervention, less than two millimeter step off instability and altered contact in the femur and the tibia. But there are contraindications, those patients with infection, severe soft tissue loss, severe bone loss, non-correctable articular deformity, or advanced arthritis would be contraindications for uh, intra-articular osteotomy. So where have this case has been? If these are so important, you see them a lot in the proximal tibia. We don't really see that many in the distal femur. They're there, but I think there are fewer of them. And that's because there's improved training. I think the exposures, being able to visualize more people are aware of them, so they're able to reduce them. And I think there's also increased awareness uh, of uh, occult fractures like Hoffa fractures. There are a number of references which can help you with this particular topic. And these are available. But I find even more valuable are some of the older works that are more comprehensive and more technique driven. So Joe Schatzker's uh, uh, paper in the orthopedic clinics in 1990, very, very helpful. There's a very obscure book called Corrective Osteotomies in the Lower Extremity After Trauma, edited by Harholzer, which I think if we all wrote that uh, uh, Springer Verlag might uh, republish. And then Jeff Mass had an article uh, in another book called Trauma, Trauma Dis Traumatic Disorders of the Knee, also by Springer Verlag. Really, really valuable, uh, helpful uh, references. So by the way, what happened to our lady? Here she is. What I planned on doing for this particular patient was to repair the non-union and unload the medial side. She had already healed her malunion and, and her step off had, had uh, softened. And so I wanted to create stable fixation, give her her age, as well as her desire of just getting the most simple, uh, approaching it the most simply simple way, uh, went in and fixed her, her uh, non-union and unloaded the joint, as I said. So put the uh, joint line a little bit on the lateral side and got her stable fixation and she goes on to heal. So osteotomies to address these deformities are complex and they're more complex than standard osteotomies and their outcome are not as well known uh, in their e and that's because each case varies so much. So in summary for these patients, early intervention is really helpful. You have to, be under, uh, you have, to have an excellent understanding of the vascular supply, the distal femur, and understand the principles and stick to them. Jeff Mast had given us some uh, wisdom he, when he said that it's been shown that surgical correction of a case complicated by malunion, I'm sorry, by malalignment or a malaligned nonunion is very difficult. And when you critically look at them after the treatment, there's usually a fair amount of room for improvement. For this reason, undertaking such a case is, uh, requires the utmost in planning, execution, and commitment from the surgical team. So I'd encourage you to make sure that you have all available resources before you tackle these cases. Thank you for your attention.